Nine people wounded in a knife attack on board a company bus. U.S. soldier Bradley Manning found guilty of espionage but not aiding the enemy. And Israelis and Palestinians aim to reach a peace deal in nine months. Hello and a very good evening. An employee of a fruit juice firm in Taipo has been arrested after he allegedly attacked his colleagues with a cleaver on board a company bus. Nine people, including the suspect, were injured, while three others reported feeling unwell. Sources say the man was fired earlier and today was his last day at work. Vicky Kong reports. The incident took place on board an employee's shuttle bus traveling on Yunlong Highway this morning. Police say a man attacked his colleagues with a cleaver. Officers later found what's believed to be the weapon used. The vehicle was carrying 29 staff members, including the suspect of a company that produces and exports fruit juice. It was heading from Tunmun to Taipo when the attack occurred. Police say after the 57-year-old suspect went on the rampage, passengers joined hands in subduing him. Officers say he was agitated before the assault, but was calm when he was arrested. To the best of our knowledge, he does not have any mental uh, illness. The fruit juice company, which is located in Taipo, today refused to comment on the case. But sources said the suspect had been bullied by his colleagues. He was laid off earlier and today was supposed to be his last day at work. The suspect was also injured in the incident. We believe it's due, possibly due to work issues. Uh, this is something we ha still have to verify, but obviously we'll look at every single possibility, not just that matter. The actual uh, arrested person is uh, currently receiving medical treatment. The victims mostly suffered head and arm injuries, but they are not believed to be life-threatening. Police sought to assure the public that today's attack was an isolated case. The Secretary for Labor and Welfare, Matthew Cheung, said the Labor Department will contact the employer to learn more about the attack. Vicky Kong, TVB News. The founder of Centerline Property Agency, Xi Wing Ching, says he doesn't know the motive for the attack targeting him yesterday. The attack occurred yesterday morning as he was driving in Taikok Choi. She said the attackers told him he needed to be taught a lesson and there are things that he shouldn't do. But she said he doesn't know what the attackers were referring to. Police are still investigating the case. The turning overseas now. The Israelis and Palestinians now aim to reach a peace deal within nine months. All the contentious issues, including the future of Jerusalem and Jewish settlements, will be on the table. This after the two sides wrapped up two days of ice-breaking talks in Washington yesterday. Before the start of day two of the talks, U.S. President Barack Obama got himself involved by meeting with the Israeli and Palestinian negotiators at the White House. And then it was down to business. The two sides have now agreed to meet again within two weeks to start substantive talks in hopes of reaching a final settlement. Our objective will be to achieve a final status agreement over the course of the next nine months. A viable two-state solution is the only way this conflict can end, and there is not much time to achieve it, and there is no other alternative. Palestinians have suffered enough. And no one benefits more from the success of this endeavor more than Palestinians. I'm delighted that all final status issues are on the table and will be resolved without any exceptions. And it's time for the Palestinian people to have an independent, sovereign state of their own. We all know that it's not going to be easy. It's going to be hard with ups and downs. But can I, I can assure you that these negotiations, in these negotiations, it's not our intention to argue about the past, but to create solutions and make decisions for the future. But U.S. officials have already warned the dispute over Jewish settlements would be a key sticking point. Washington expects that the Israelis will continue expanding the settlements over the course of the negotiations, despite U.S. and Palestinian objections. And after years of mutual mistrust, 
Still a lot of skepticism among the people. This Jerusalem resident said all the talks will lead to nothing, adding that the Palestinians make demands all the time and there's just no peace at all. Similar views in the occupied West Bank. Have the Israelis given up anything over the years? Asked this Hebron resident. These talks will turn out to be fruitless, he said. Staying in the region, and there have been more protests in Egypt in support of ousted President Mohamed Morsi. Thousands of his supporters rallied in Cairo to denounce his removal from power by the military. Members of the Muslim Brotherhood have rejected calls to work with the country's new leaders and insist that Morsi be reinstated. Meantime, more foreign diplomats have now met the former president after the European Union foreign policy chief paid him a visit on Monday. An African delegation held a one-hour meeting with Morsi and two American senators, Lindsey Graham and John McCain, hope to travel to Egypt next week as part of efforts to resolve the country's political crisis. The driver of last week's deadly train crash in Spain was on the phone with a colleague and apparently looking at a document at the time the train derailed. That comes from the initial reading of the train's so-called black box released by the court investigating the case. It also revealed that just before the crash, the train was traveling at 192 kilometers per hour, more than double the speed limit of 80 kilometers per hour for that stretch of the railway. When it hit the deadly curve, the train had slowed down a bit, but was still going at more than 150 kilometers per hour. The train hurtled off the tracks and slammed into a concrete wall, killing 79 of the 218 passengers aboard. The driver, Francisco Gazon, has been charged with negligent homicide. A U.S. military tribunal has found Army soldier Bradley Manning guilty of espionage for providing the website WikiLeaks with thousands of battlefield reports and diplomatic cables. But as Alan Bogna reports, he was not found guilty of the most serious charge against him, aiding the enemy. The 700,000 reports leaked by U.S. Army Private Bradley Manning make it the largest unauthorized release of classified data in U.S. history. Manning was convicted of 20 out of the 22 charges against him, some of which he had already pleaded guilty to. The prosecution had argued that Manning knew the material he leaked would be seen by terrorist organizations, a key point they needed to prove for a conviction of aiding the enemy. By being found not guilty of that charge, Manning escapes a potential sentence of life in prison. Manning said he leaked the material to expose the U.S. military's bloodlust and disregard for human life and what he considered American diplomatic deceit. Speaking in an interview at the Ecuadorian embassy in London, WikiLeaks founder Julian Assange criticized the guilty verdicts, describing them as dangerous national security extremism. It is important that this precedent of charging journalistic sources with espionage not be permitted to stand. It is a serious precedent, uh, it is a serious abuse, and it will mean the end of national security journalism in the United States. Outside the courthouse, a group of Manning supporters hailed him as a hero rather than a criminal. If people like Bradley can't stand up and tell us what our government is doing when it's wrong, ostensibly wrong, then we're in a lot of trouble. As an American and as a retired officer from the U.S. Army, I am embarrassed that we don't allow facts out, that the only way facts get out is when a leaker like Bradley Manning lets them out. Manning still faces up to 136 years in prison when sentencing begins later today. Alan Bruckner, TVB News. A university student in California has reached a settlement with the U.S. government after he was abandoned in a federal detention cell for over four days without food or water. Daniel Chong was flanked by his lawyers as he recalled the ordeal. The 24-year-old engineering student at the University of California, San Diego, was arrested along with eight others during a drug raid on the home of a friend in April last year. Authorities seized a quantity of drugs but later determined that Chong was not part of the ring. 
His lawyer said an officer put Chong into a windowless cell under the Drug Enforcement Administration and said they would come to get him in a minute. Instead, Chong was abandoned in the cell for four and a half days and he had to drink his own urine to stay alive. By the time he was found, he was suffering from severe dehydration, muscle deterioration and kidney failure. He lost 15 pounds during the ordeal and was hospitalized for five days. Chong sued the government and settled for 4.1 million U.S. dollars. New York City's effort to crack down on big sugary sodas is staying on hold. The city's effort to cap soft drink portions has drawn international attention. Some health experts laud it as an overdue attack on one of the primary contributors to obesity, while late-night TV hosts rib the city's mayor as a nutrition nanny. A mid-level state appeals court ruled Tuesday that New York City's Board of Health exceeded its authority when it put a 16-ounce size limit on soft drinks served in public places. New York Mayor Michael Bloomberg, the driving force behind the regulation, promised a quick appeal. And still to come in the news. Violent crime reports went down in the first half of the year. Applications for the Guangdong scheme begin tomorrow. And a daring stunt in Kunming. Back tonight with more local news. The number of violent crimes reported to the police in the first half of the year went down when compared with the same period last year. Crimes committed over the internet, however, rose sharply and became more sophisticated. Jared Silver reports. Generally, Hong Kong is becoming a more law-abiding city, according to the latest police figures. In the first half of the year, the overall crime rate went down 4% when compared with the same period last year. Violent crimes, which included homicides and robberies, also dropped by almost 6%. As for drug seizures by the police and customs officers, at first glance, the figures may raise eyebrows. For example, the amount of ecstasy tablets seized shot up by more than 1,000%. Methamphetamine, commonly known as ice, surged by 400% and heroin by 82%. Still, the police say there is no reason for alarm. That's because drug seizures mean better intelligence and not necessarily more drugs available in Hong Kong streets. Hong Kong is definitely not a, a distribution centre or a, a manufacturing centre. Um, usually, um, because Hong Kong is a transportation hub within the uh, region, so maybe there are some of the drug syndicate make use of Hong Kong as a transit point. But while police figures seem to show that Hong Kong is becoming a safer city every year, it is in the borderless world of the internet that overly trusting residents are increasingly falling prey to crime. Increasing connectivity through new technologies such as smartphones makes life easier, but it also means more exposure to online criminals. In the first six months of the year, blackmail cases went up by more than 60 percent. The main reason, in fact, uh, uh, is about uh, um, the chatting uh, over the uh, over the internet um, without uh, indecent chatting, shall I say, indecent chatting, and that uh, some of the male uh, victims were tempted on the internet to take off their clothes or to do some indecent act in front of a female uh, culprit. And um, once they do that, they, their pictures will, will, will be taken or some uh, video clips will be taken, and after that they will be blackmailed. The amount of money extorted from victims in such cases varied from $500 to $150,000. Other types of internet scams that are becoming more prevalent include email fraud and deception over social networks. Police say it is usually hard to make arrests in such cases because very often those responsible are not based in Hong Kong. Juan da Silva, TVB News. 
Starting from October, the old age allowance will be extended to Hong Kong's senior citizens living in Guangdong province. A special one-off arrangement will be in place in the first year of the Guangdong scheme. Eligible applicants who have continuously lived in Guangdong for at least 309 days can apply for the so-called monthly fruit money without having to satisfy the one-year continuous residence rule in Hong Kong. But they still have to come back to the SAR to apply for the allowance. The whole scheme is to provide a choice for uh, elderly citizens that whether or not they want to uh, retire on the mainland is entirely their choice. So it's not to encourage, but rather to facilitate them if they are sick. We'll make arrangements for the, the International Social Service to help them to proceed with the application, including home visits. Cheng was speaking at the office of the newly designated Social Security Field Unit in Sheng Shui, where will begin taking applications for the Guangdong scheme tomorrow. He also said there is no need to rush in with the application because as long as senior citizens file it before October 1st, the government will back pay the allowance to October. Those who are eligible for the monthly $1,135 old age allowance will have to complete their application procedure in person in Hong Kong, but they can post their applications to the unit's office to make an appointment first. Let's go. President Zhang Yong Sing said today government officials should make serving the public their priority rather than worry about their privacy. This as he waded into the conflict of interest controversy embroiling Secretary for Development Paul Chan. And as Evelyn Leung reports, Chan admitted today that he could have handled the crisis better. Yet another day of grilling for Secretary for Development Paul Chan at the Legislative Council today. But unlike at previous meetings, some voiced support for the embattled development chief. If you require government officials to declare interests of their spouses and children, well, this is against international practice and it's not, also not feasible and not reasonable. Lastly, there is no need, absolutely no need for the secretary to step down because he has declared interest in accordance with government requirements. But others continue to slam Chan over the land his family owns in areas slated for redevelopment in the Northeast New Territories. He claimed to be the landowner in 96 and collected rent there. He said he took his family members occasionally to the plot to farming. Is it true that he doesn't know about the development in the area? In 08, our community talked about any anti development. Is it true that he did not see that his plot is inside the development boundary. I think he is lying. Chan admitted he made mistakes. I know the opinion and criticisms uh, by many in the community. Look back, I do believe I could have handled the matter better. Thank you. But some feel an apology is not enough. The Legislative Council President Zhang yuk Seng meanwhile said if the public is not happy with Paul Chan's explanation, then the government has to find a way to deal with this. He said during a radio interview today, government officials have to put public interests before their own privacy. The Legislative President also wants the Council's rules of procedure on filibusters to be clarified amid threats by some lawmakers that more filibuster attempts will be carried out in future. Zhang said it should be stated clearly when he and other lawmakers can stop filibustering attempts. Evelyn Lang, TVB News. The Center for Food Safety says four samples of food failed its latest round of chemical and biological tests. One sample of baby Shanghai Green had levels of the metal cadmium, which was slightly over the legal limit. A sample of frozen black cod steak was found with a higher level of mercury than allowed. And in a fresh milk sample, the total bacterial count was six times above the legal limit. The center says despite the unsatisfactory results, they, these don't pose any immediate danger to health. But one sample of fermented red bean curd was found to contain Sudan 2, a potentially cancer-causing color additive which is banned. Sales are now suspended and the importer is recalling the bean curd from retailers. All right, Tony, over to you for sports. That's right. Well, we've got cricket to talk about because it's England against Australia again, part three. Woohoo!
OK, England have promised not to let their guard down when they take on Australia in the third and decisive Ashes test tomorrow. The hosts have a 2-0 lead and can win the series if they seal the deal at Old Trafford. England are looking to get the job done against Australia when the third Ashes test begins tomorrow in Manchester. With the hosts leading 2-0 in the five-match series, a victory over the tourists at Old Trafford would ensure England getting their hands on the urn again. But star bowler James Anderson, who's 13 wickets in the first two tests, help England to victory, says the team are keeping their feet on the ground. It's not something that we're really focusing on, to be honest. We're, we're, we don't want to look too far ahead. Like I said, we, we played really well in the first two games, and our job now is to try and improve on those first two games, um, show some of the form that we did, and, and tighten up on the, the areas that we could tighten up on. For Australia, they've recalled batsman David Warner to the squad following his two-match suspension for punching England batsman Joe Root in a bar shortly before the first test. David brings a lot of energy to the group always, you know, he's just one of those guys, he's, um, he goes at 100 miles an hour, so, um, you know, it's fantastic to see him get runs, he's such a, a destructive player that if he, he bats for a while he could, he could put some real pressure on England. And just a quick update on the Ashes. England say that Kevin Peterson has recovered from a calf injury and should be fit to play in the series beginning tomorrow. Well, on to the other major batting sport and World Series champs San Francisco were put in their place by Philadelphia, who were hungry for a win. Carlos Ruiz and Michael Young hit two run homers as the Phillies beat the Giants 7-3. to The win ended their run of eight consecutive losses. Down the road in Baltimore, Chris Davis hit his 38th home run of the season, the most so far in the major leagues. Chen Wei Yin's effort on the mound also held the Orioles to a 4-3 victory over Houston. And at the World Swimming Championships in Barcelona, Katie Ledecky set the pool alight with another superb effort. Her second goal of the meet came in the 1,500 meters freestyle. The American went head-to-head -head with Denmark's Lottie Fries before she sprinted away in the final 100 metres to win in a world record time of 15 minutes, 36.53 seconds. Her first goal came in the 400 metres freestyle on Sunday, and after this effort, she will be favourite to win the 800 metres as well. And our final story for tonight is not for the faint of heart. It's about a tough balancing act between moving objects in mid-air. An ethnic Uyghur tightrope walker pulled off this stunning feat in Yunnan province yesterday. He completed a high-wire walk between two hot air balloons in just over 38 seconds. That's a new Guinness World Record. The two balloons were connected by an 18-metre-long, 5-centimetre-wide steel beam. At one point, he had to squat on the beam to maintain balance. But it was smooth sailing from then on. Traditional stunts between two stationary points are difficult enough, but this one sure puts him on top of them all. I can barely walk a straight line normally. Wow, that's all <laughs> I'll say. That's pretty amazing. <laughs> it is. That's the news for tonight. Thanks for watching. Good night. Good evening, it was mainly fine with a few showers today. At 5 p.m., high pressure brought generally fine weather to southeastern China. And today's temperatures ranged from 27.7 to 32.4 degrees, and the relative humidity was between 70 to 94 percent. Moderate easterly winds. The current temperature is now standing at 29.5 degrees Celsius, and the relative humidity is 81 percent. 0.5 millimeters of rain has been recorded since midnight. So, Freddie, how's the weather tomorrow? There will be sunny intervals and a few showers tomorrow. Temperatures will range from 26 to 31 degrees. Expect squally showers in the following few days. Tomorrow's API is forecast at 10 to 55, and the air pollution level will range from low to high. The maximum UV index forecast for tomorrow will be about 9. And now to the latest global weather update. Thunderstorms in Shanghai, showers in Taipei, cloudy in Xiamen. Thunderstorms in Guangzhou, showers in Macau, cloudy in Chengdu. Thunderstorms in Beijing, cloudy in Seoul, rain in Tokyo. Thunderstorms in Bangkok, rain in Ho Chi Minh City and Manila. Bright in Kuala Lumpur, thunderstorms in Singapore, showers in Jakarta. Thunderstorms in New Delhi, rain in Karachi and Mumbai. 
Sunny in Cairo, showers in Nairobi. Showers in Brisbane, bright in Sydney and Melbourne, rain in Auckland. Cloudy in Toronto, thunderstorms in New York. Sunny in Vancouver, cloudy in San Francisco, bright in Los Angeles. Sunny in London, Paris, Amsterdam and Zurich, bright in Frankfurt. And that's the weather. Have a lovely evening.